Well, we're just thrilled to have you all here this evening. Uh, needless to say, the last couple of years have been a challenge for all of us in this room, all of us on this planet, and especially on Mount Wilson, not only did you know we had to deal with uh, COVID, but the Bobcat fire last fall, and the response and the support we've gotten from all of you has just been incredible. And we appreciate it deeply. Uh, our season this year, because of the on and off nature of COVID, has been a little, well, a little sporadic. And we're just so happy that we're able to have this, con er, this lecture tonight, and especially to have with us uh, Josh Simon, uh, staff astronomer at the uh, Carnegie Observatory. As many of you know, uh, Andrew Carnegie and the Carnegie Institution of Science of Washington were the ones who provided the seed money to my grandfather back in 1904 to build the first telescope here and, and, and the subsequent telescopes, uh, the 60 inch and, and the 100 inch. And, uh, and we're also very fortunate because Josh is a trustee of the uh, Bob Wilson Institute, which runs the facilities of the observatory, and we're thrilled to have him. Josh grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and came west to go to school, got his BS in physics from Stanford University, and then uh, had an epiphany and migrated across the bay to Berkeley, my alma mater, Go Bears, <laughs> and got his uh, MS and PhD in astrophysics from the University of California at Berkeley. And then, and then moved on to Caltech, where he was the Robert Millikan postdoctoral scholar uh, at Caltech in astronomy. From there, he went on to Carnegie, where he was the Vera Rubin Fellow beginning in 2008. And then in 2010, became the staff astronomer at Carnegie. He is viewed at major telescopes all over the world the Hubble uh, included, and his specialty that he spends the majority of his time on is dark matter. And tonight, the subject of his talk is the dark side of the galaxies. And let's welcome Josh Simon. Well, thank you, Sam, for that introduction. And uh, I also want to really thank all of you for driving up here uh, to spend the evening with us at Mount Wilson. This is the first presentation that I've been able to give in uh, over a year and a half. And so it's a real pleasure to be able to tell you tonight about uh, dark matter and galaxies. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is uh, give you an introduction to galaxies. My research at Carnegie focuses on studying some of the closest galaxies to our Milky Way. And the idea behind that is that these are the galaxies that we can observe the best uh, and uh, learn the most about because astronomically speaking, they're sitting right under our noses, just a few hundred thousand to a few million light years away. <laughs> uh, and then we can use what we learn from these very nearby galaxies to improve the extrapolations that we have to make when studying much more distant galaxies which of course make up most of the universe. What I'll particularly be emphasizing is not just the uh, part of galaxies that we're all familiar with, the stars, but also the hidden side of galaxies, which is made up of a mysterious substance called dark matter that turns out to be far more important to the evolution of galaxies than the stars are. And one of the key goals of the next generation of telescopes that are currently in the planning and construction stages is to provide us with new clues to exactly what this dark stuff might be. So I'll begin with an introduction to galaxies. I think probably most of you are uh, already familiar with what a galaxy is, but it's always good to start off on some common ground. And besides, this gives me an excuse to show you some pretty pictures, which of course is half the point of astronomy anyway. <laughs> so then uh, I'll tell you uh, more specifically about our, our Milky Way, some of the, uh, the nearby galaxies uh, in our group of galaxies. Uh, and then in the second half of my talk, I'll uh, move on to dark matter. And in particular, I'll tell you about a theoretical problem in the study of dark matter that many astronomers, including me, have been struggling with 
for the past 20 years. So, uh, just to make sure we're starting off on the same page, what is a galaxy? Well, as the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia tells us, a galaxy is a group of stars and gas that's held together by its own gravity. Um, I think the image that we tend to have in our heads of what a galaxy looks like is something like this grand design spiral galaxy that you can see here. Uh, but not all galaxies share that, that basic structure. There are also elliptical galaxies, as you can see on the left here. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, both of these galaxies are roughly 100,000 to a few hundred thousand light years in diameter. Um, but not all galaxies are anywhere near this big. So there, there's also another uh, class of galaxies called dwarf galaxies because of their small sizes. Uh, here's a dwarf elliptical galaxy on the left. This looks a lot like the much larger elliptical that I just showed you, uh, except that this object is only uh, about 20,000 light years from one side to the other. Uh, and these elliptical galaxies, um, even though they look much less interesting visually, astronomers uh, are still very interested in them because uh, the largest elliptical, the largest galaxies in the universe, uh, not, not this one, but like the, uh, the, the counterpart I showed you on the previous slide, uh, are almost always elliptical galaxies. And also the biggest black holes uh, tend to be located exclusively in very large elliptical galaxies. Now, for uh, spiral galaxies, their counterparts, when you get into the dwarf galaxy regime, are called dwarf irregulars. Uh, so galaxies that are significantly smaller than the Milky Way, they're not able to form those uh, beautiful spiral arms that we like to see. Uh, and so the, uh, the structure ends up just kind of looking like a bit of a mess, and hence the name irregular. So in terms of their shapes, Galaxies can be spiral, elliptical, or regular. Um, and then in terms of their physical properties, galaxies also span uh, a wide range uh, of, of characteristics. So the mass of a galaxy can be anywhere from about a million times the mass of the sun to, uh, for the largest galaxies, as much as 10 trillion solar masses. The luminosity of a galaxy, how bright it is, uh, the, the faintest galaxies that have been uncovered so far are only about a thousand times brighter than our sun, whereas the largest giant ellipticals can have a trillion uh, solar luminosities. And then their physical sizes, uh, the tiniest galaxies uh, found, uh, that we've found, which I'll show you some of, uh, can be just about a hundred light years from one end to the other, whereas the largest can, uh, can get close to 300,000 light years across. So what's responsible for these enormous differences from one galaxy to the next? Well, one thing is just how much material a galaxy is able to accumulate as it forms. Um, so that, uh, that obviously leaves some galaxies much bigger than others. But as you've already seen, there can be galaxies with relatively similar sizes that have very different appearances. And so the other most important factor that controls what a galaxy looks like is whether it contains any cold gas. And that's because cold gas is the fuel out of which uh, new stars are born. Uh, so spiral galaxies are quite rich in cold gas. They're still forming new stars today. So in our Milky Way, on average, uh, one new star or a few new stars are born every year. Elliptical galaxies, on the other hand, have used up all their cold gas. They may, may still contain significant amounts of gas, but that gas is at much higher temperatures. And so it's not able to uh, condense into the kinds of clouds that can form new stars. So elliptical galaxies formed all of their stars billions of years ago. And that's why they look so smooth and boring today. Okay, so I don't want to go into much detail on uh, star formation because that could easily be its own entire lecture. But just to give you an idea of how uh, the formation of new stars affects the appearance of a galaxy, here's an image of the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. And if you look at its spiral arms, you'll see that they're traced out by these red knots. Uh, each of these is uh, a place where a cluster of new star stars formed recently. And if you could see them, uh, zoom in and see them in more detail, they would look something like this. So there's a cluster, of thousands, uh, up to millions, of very bright, hot, young blue stars. 
And they're surrounded by a cocoon of gas and dust. That's the material that they formed out of. Uh, over time, the fierce winds from these young stars blow that, uh, that cocoon of dust away. In fact, you can kind of see that process going on here. The, the winds from the stars have already evacuated uh, this region, and they're pushing this gas uh, away from them. And over a few more million years, it will dissipate. And what you'll be left with is just uh, this bright blue cluster of stars. And so that's why the spiral arms of galaxies have a blue appearance. All right, so next let's talk a little bit about what galaxies are made of. So we know that galaxies have to have stars in them. That was part of the definition. But it turns out that when you do the accounting, stars add up to about 10% of the mass of a typical galaxy. All right, so what else is there? Well, I just told you that galaxies can have gas in them. That's the fuel out of which they make new stars. Uh, but in almost all cases, uh, galaxies have much less gas than they do stars. Uh, so the gas makes up only 1% or at most a few percent of the mass of a typical galaxy. What else is there? Well, so we can see that galaxies contain dust. So in this image of the Sombrero galaxy here, you can see a dark lane uh, obscuring part of the middle of the galaxy. So this is uh, a thin layer of interstellar dust. This dust can be very effective at blocking the light from a galaxy, but it takes very little dust to actually accomplish that. Uh, and so uh, even, um, even a tiny amount of dust can, can actually um, uh, cause the appearance of, of these kinds of dark lanes. And dust uh, ends up being about 100 times less abundant in galaxies than gas. So it's just a, a small fraction of a percent of the total. Uh, all right, so when we put all the parts of the galaxy that we can see together, we're still just barely over 10% of the total. So what else is there? The other 89% of a galaxy is made of a very strange substance called dark matter. I'll go into more detail uh, about dark matter a little bit later on. But for now, I'll just say that this is a completely new form of matter that's never been detected before. And it doesn't give off any light, which obviously makes it a bit of a challenge for us to study. OK, so we've dealt with the basics of galaxies now. Uh, and let's move on to some specific galaxies that may be of particular interest. So here's a picture of the Milky Way. Uh, and even if this image were the only thing that you knew about the Milky Way, uh, it would be obvious that our Milky Way is not an elliptical galaxy, uh, which are, it's all the same, the same color all over, uh, completely devoid of, of uh, gas and dust. Um, instead, our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. And so spiral galaxies, their three-dimensional shape, uh, they can be enormous across uh, 100,000 light years or more, as I've, as I've already mentioned. Uh, but they're very thin. So the shape of a spiral galaxy is uh, something like a plate, a DVD, a Frisbee, whatever your favorite round flat object is. Uh, and so you can imagine that if you uh, happen to live on the edge of an object shape like that, uh, and uh, you were looking up at, uh, at it in the sky, you would see uh, this, uh, this flat structure just uh, cover a, a small band across the sky, exactly as we see our Milky Way if you go someplace a little bit less light polluted than Los Angeles. <laughs> On the other hand, if we lived in an elliptical galaxy, that would fill up the entire night sky, uh, and so things would look very different to us. Now, if we could uh, go up above the Milky Way and view it face on, we think it would look something like this. So the galaxy has a bar at its center. Uh, it has several prominent spiral arms. And then the sun is located here just kind of in between a few of the main spiral arms, about 25,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. Now, most galaxies like the Milky Way live in small groups of galaxies with a few big galaxies and a larger number of small galaxies. So one example of such a group of galaxies is the Leo triplet, uh, which you can see here, composed of three galaxies in the constellation of Leo. Um, it turns out that for completely unrelated reasons, uh, my younger son is also named Leo. <laughs> Fortunately, he did not turn out to be triplets, or I think my wife probably would have killed him. <laughs> Uh, so like the Leo triplet, the Milky Way lives in a group of three galaxies. Uh, because astronomers are not very creative at coming up with names for things, this group is called the local group. Uh, and so the local group has, has these three main galaxies, the Milky Way, 
uh, Andromeda, also known as M31. And then the third spiral galaxy is called M33. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> surrounding these, these spiral galaxies is a menagerie of about 100 dwarf galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a better picture of Andromeda, also called uh, M31, Messier 31, which is the other main galaxy in the local group. So this is a spiral galaxy. Uh, it, we think it's very similar to our Milky Way. Uh, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, not forming quite as many new stars anymore, but, but on the whole, uh, quite comparable. And Andromeda is located about two and a half million light years away from us. This is M33, which is the third uh, spiral galaxy in the local group. Uh, M33 is a, is a substantially smaller galaxy. It's only about one-tenth the size of the Milky Way and M31. Uh, what's nice about M33 is that it's oriented much more face-on towards us. So uh, we can get a much better view of its overall structure than we can with the Milky Way, where we're sitting right in, in the middle of it, and Andromeda, which we see much more edge on. And unlike uh, the, its bigger counterparts, M33 does not seem to have any dwarf galaxies orbiting it. Now, the three-dimensional view of the local group uh, is something like this. So we've got the Milky Way over here, uh, Andromeda over on the right, with M33 right next to it, and then clustered very tightly around each of the big spiral galaxies uh, are, are these groups of dwarf galaxies. There are also a few lonely dwarf galaxies off all by themselves, like here, but for the most part, uh, they tend to be found quite close to uh, the bigger spirals. Now, uh, the two biggest dwarf galaxies orbiting our Milky Way uh, are the Magellanic Clouds. Now again, illustrating our lack of creativity, the bigger of the two, this one here, is known as the Large Magellanic Cloud. And you'll never guess what the smaller one is called. <laughs> okay, it's the Small Magellanic Cloud. Uh, so this is an image uh, showing the two Magellanic Clouds uh, in the sky taken from Australia. Uh, unfortunately, these galaxies are located too far south to be visible from Mount Wilson. But if any of you have vi ever visited the Southern Hemisphere, you've probably seen them uh, in the sky at night. They're easily visible to the naked eye. Uh, you just may not have realized that those fuzzy uh, patches that you saw uh, up above you were actually entirely separate galaxies. Now, uh, the reason that uh, these galaxies are named after Ferdinand Magellan is because he was the first uh, Westerner to leave us a record of their existence. Now, of course, he doesn't really deserve credit for discovering the galaxies. Uh, they were obvious to anybody who lived in South America, Africa, Australia for thousands of years before he came along. Uh, it's just that those people didn't uh, uh, leave uh, crew logs and diaries to send back to Europe uh, to tell, um, <clears throat> tell the Europeans about these amazing uh, clouds they saw in the sky. So here's a closer view of the large Magellanic Cloud. This is obviously a dwarf irregular galaxy. Uh, the LNC, it's uh, almost large enough to be a spiral. If you, if you zoomed out a little bit more from this image, you would see just the hints of uh, some spiral arms trying to form in its outskirts. Uh, but on the whole, obviously, it has uh, quite an irregular structure. Here's the small Magellanic Cloud. Uh, and the image on the left shows the stars in the galaxy. Um, this is a smaller uh, galaxy, still a dwarf irregular. Um, and it's not forming as many new stars as uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud is anymore. I, I, I uh, neglected to say that the Large Magellanic Cloud is about 150,000 light years away. Uh, the small cloud is a little bit farther, about 180,000 light years. Now, th this image on the right, uh, I just couldn't resist uh, showing you because I think it looks so amazing. So this is a, a picture of the ionized gas in the galaxy. So this is the gas that's been heated up by the formation of new stars. And every place that there's a cluster of stars forming in the galaxy, uh, they blow a bubble of hot gas uh, that, that you can see throughout this image. And I think you can see these, uh, these bubbles more clearly uh, in this galaxy than anywhere else in the universe. Uh, this is NGC 6822, which is another dwarf irregular galaxy in the local group. Uh, this one is even smaller than the Magellanic Clouds. 
uh, not forming as many, as many stars, although you can still see a few of these, uh, these glowing bubbles. Uh, and this is located uh, about, um, uh, about a million light years away from us. Now here's a much smaller dwarf galaxy. This is more typical of what most dwarf galaxies look like. These are tiny things with only a few hundred thousand to maybe a few million stars in them. Actually, uh, this galaxy, LEO2, is one of the brighter satellites of the Milky Way. Um, I've already showed you uh, so most of the things that are brighter than it, and uh, there's, there's a whole range of even fainter galaxies that we'll get to a little bit later on. And LEO2 is located about 700,000 light years away from us. Um, now, as with many other areas in astronomy, Mount Wilson uh, played an important role in the development of the field of dwarf galaxies. So in fact, other than the Magellanic Clouds, which of course were known for uh, centuries, millennia, uh, the first six dwarf galaxies orbiting the Milky Way were all discovered by uh, astronomers with Mount Wilson connections. So the first two objects were discovered in 1938 by Harlow Shapley, who you've probably heard of. Uh, at this time, he was the director of the observatory at Harvard, uh, but at the beginning of his career, he started off as an astronomer at Mount Wilson. The next two dwarf galaxies to be discovered were Leo 1 and Leo 2 in 1950. And those were found by uh, Albert Wilson, an astronomer at uh, Mount Wilson, and a colleague of his at, at Caltech, Robert Harrington. And then a few years later, uh, Wilson discovered two more dwarf galaxies in the constellations Draco and Ursa Minor. Uh, by that time, he had actually moved on to become the director of Lowell Observatory. Uh, and so this uh, maybe gives you a little bit of a flavor for not only how central Mount Wilson has been in astronomical discoveries, but uh, its importance in, in creating the next generation of astronomical leaders uh, through the, the first half of the 20th century. <clears throat> All right, so now we've covered the basics about galaxies. Let's go back to our pie chart, where everything that we can see is just these, uh, these little slices here. And the other 89% of galaxies is made up of something else that we've never encountered before. Now, as you can imagine, this is a bit of an uncomfortable situation, where uh, the things that we understand turn out to be just a minor component of the universe. And it's a bit inconvenient for those of us who are trying to make a living studying the light given off by celestial objects that most of the universe uh, is completely invisible. <laughs> but as astronomers tend to learn pretty early in their careers, the universe doesn't care that much what we think. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, the observational data on galaxies have forced us to con conclude that this picture is most likely correct. And so what we're left to do is just make the best of it and see if we can figure out uh, exactly what this dark stuff might be. So probably the first question that's on your mind uh, about dark matter is if it doesn't give off any light, then how can we be sure that it's really there? So we know that galaxies contain dark matter because we can uh, see its gravitational effects on the parts of the galaxy that do give off light, the stars and the gas. So uh, spiral galaxies spin around uh, in a circle, just like a, a frisbee and all the other round flat objects that I mentioned earlier. So that means that if you're looking at a spiral galaxy, one side of that galaxy is always moving towards you and the other side of the galaxy is always moving away from you. Uh, and that, uh, then the Doppler uh, effect causes the wavelengths of the light from the side of the galaxy moving towards you and the side moving away from you to be slightly different. Uh, so this is the same uh, physical uh, uh, reason that an ambulance siren or a train whistle changes pitch as the vehicle goes by you. And it's also the same way that a radar gun uh, works to uh, uh, measure how fast your car is going, hopefully not too fast on the way up here, uh, or on the way back down later, uh, or how fast you can throw a baseball, and so on. So we can use the Doppler shift to, uh, to measure the speed at which galaxies are rotating. And then in just the same way that we use uh, the speed of the Earth's orbit around the sun to tell us how much the sun weighs, we can use the speed at which the stars and gas are orbiting around a galaxy to tell us how much a galaxy weighs. So that gives us the total mass of a galaxy. Uh, and now we can take a picture and see how many so uh, stars the galaxy contains. 
we have a pretty good understanding of stars these days, and so we can make a, a good estimate of how much those stars weigh. And what we find when we compare those two numbers is that galaxies weigh about 10 times as much as all other stars put together. So it's as if I woke up one morning, stepped on my scale, and looked down, and it told me that I weighed 1,500 pounds. My first thought would probably be that I should head to Target and get a new scale, but if I then tested out uh, the scale with the weights of some objects uh, that I knew and found that it was giving me the right answer, then I'd be forced to conclude that uh, there, there must be something else accounting for most of the weight on the scale that I can't see. And in the case of galaxies, that something is dark matter. All right, so I suspect that your next question is going to be, what is dark matter? Uh, it turns out it's a little bit easier to start with the opposite question, what isn't dark matter? So the first thing that most people think of when they hear the phrase dark matter is that it uh, must be referring to black holes. Uh, we're actually pretty sure at this point that dark matter is not made of black holes. Uh, there's, there's kind of one possibility that hasn't been totally ruled out yet, uh, but most likely uh, dark matter is not, uh, doesn't have anything to do with black holes. It's also not made of faint stars like brown dwarfs and white dwarfs. It doesn't have any connection to any of the products of stellar evolution. So in fact, uh, we believe that dark matter uh, actually uh, can't be made of ordinary matter, the atoms and molecules all around us at all. It has to be something fundamentally different. So we think that dark matter is actually a new kind of subatomic particle uh, that's never been seen before. So you can think of this as a little bit like the Higgs boson. You may have heard of its discovery about 10 years ago at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Uh, and that discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 2013. Um, so the properties of the dark matter particle may be a bit different from the Higgs boson. It probably has a different mass, and some of its quantum properties may be different as well. Uh, but conceptually, uh, it could be sort of similar. Now, what makes dark matter really unusual compared to all the other particles that we know of is that it doesn't interact with ordinary matter in any way except through gravity. So let me give you an example to illustrate what I mean when I say that it doesn't interact. So uh, imagine that I'm an Ant-Man and I get shrunk down, but instead of stopping at insect scales, I keep going all the way down to atomic scales. So then I'm, I'm wandering around up here in my quantum world and I happen to see uh, a neutron that I decide to pick up, and there's an atomic nucleus sitting over there. Just for fun, I decide to throw my neutron at the nucleus. I got pretty good aim, so hits it dead on. And now there's a couple different things that can happen. So the neutron can bounce off, knock the nucleus over a little bit. It can stick to the nucleus and form a new isotope or a new chemical element. Uh, or, if it was a particularly large nucleus, the neutron can actually split it into pieces. That's how a nuclear reactor works. So now let's say that instead of picking up a neutron, I pick up a dark matter particle and throw it at, at the nucleus again, uh, direct hit. Uh, but this time, the dark matter particle just keeps up going right on through the nucleus. doesn't even notice that anything was there. And the nucleus just sits there. It can't tell that anything hit it. So dark matter doesn't feel electric and magnetic fields. Uh, it doesn't give off any light. The only thing it can do is that if you get a whole bunch of dark matter all in one place, then it can pull on stuff with its gravity. So the discovery of this new form of matter was initially seen as very strange. But over the last several decades, theoretical astrophysicists have come up with a framework in which dark matter actually makes some sense. Uh, and in fact, um, the favored theory, which is known as cold dark matter, uh, is actually able to do an amazingly good job at explaining almost everything that we can see in the universe. Uh, going from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation, to the distribution of galaxies through space, uh, and the expansion of the universe. However, when you look carefully at individual galaxies, and especially at dwarf galaxies, then the predictions of this theory uh, don't all quite work out so well. And if you look at the history of science, sometimes it's exactly these sorts of nagging little loose threads where if you start tugging on them, they lead to an old theory unraveling, uh, and a new theory can emerge 
that provides a better description, a better understanding of the way the world actually works. And so one of the most serious of these nagging issues in the case of cold dark matter is it predicts that our Milky Way galaxy should be surrounded by an enormous number of dwarf galaxies. So uh, our theory predicts that there could be as many as a thousand dwarf galaxies orbiting the Milky Way. There should definitely be uh, several hundred. And yet as of 2004, less than 20 years ago, after decades of searching, we had only managed to find 11 dwarf galaxies orbiting our galaxy. So this seems pretty bad. Not only are we missing 80% uh, of the mass of the universe, now we can't find 99% of the galaxies either. Uh, and so that led astronomers to start asking the question of whether there could be hundreds of undiscovered dwarf galaxies uh, orbiting uh, around us that we hadn't managed to spot yet. So uh, to uh, explain this, this situation and the progress that's been made over the last 15 years, I need to tell you a little bit about how astronomers actually find dwarf galaxies. So uh, starting uh, around 1950, uh, astronomers at Mount Wilson and, and Caltech uh, began carrying out what is now known as the Palomar Sky Survey. They took photographic images covering the entire sky. Uh, and uh, so here are examples of, uh, of some of those images. And given these, uh, these images of thousands of square degrees of sky, astronomers would then sit down with a magnifying glass and literally pour over these, these glass plates or, or uh, reproductions uh, inch by inch, trying to find a little fuzzy patch of light that might be a new dwarf galaxy. Um, and just to uh, uh, add a little bit of insult to the, uh, the tedious nature of that process, the, the dwarf galaxies that, you, that were found that way were actually pretty obvious. So here are two images, one with a dwarf galaxy in it, one of another patch of sky with no dwarf galaxy. And uh, you don't actually need a PhD in, in astronomy to tell that, that there's a lot, of, a lot more stars at the center of this image than in the other one. So it's not that these galaxies are actually even that hard to find. It's just that the sky is a really big place, and so it helps a lot if you know where to look. Um, so over the course of the second half of the 20th century, astronomers carefully searched uh, all of the Palomar Sky Survey images looking for dwarf galaxies. Um, and in, in that process, they managed to find the 11 galaxies that I've mentioned. Um, now, the situation changed quite suddenly, uh, beginning in about 2005, uh, with the first data from digital sky surveys. So uh, these took over from, uh, from photographic surveys like the, uh, the Palomar Sky Survey around the beginning of the 21st century. And the digital sur sky surveys offer a couple of major advantages over the old photographic sky surveys. So first of all, digital detectors, the same kinds of things that are in, uh, in all of your phones uh, and enable them to take such great pictures, uh, are much more sensitive to light than film or photographic plates are. So they allow you to see much fainter stars. Uh, and then the other important uh, advantage that they have is that the data are recorded digitally. So you don't have to search for uh, dwarf galaxies in a way that risks uh, both your eyesight and your sanity. Um, instead, uh, you can write computer programs that will generate a catalog of every star that appears in, in any of these images. And then you can write another computer program that will search through all those stars and find groups of faint stars that might be a dwarf galaxy. So uh, to show you how that process works, uh, here again, I've got two images, this time from a digital sky survey. One of them has a dwarf galaxy in it, and one of them doesn't. Uh, but this time, we're talking about a much fainter dwarf galaxy, and so you can't actually see by eye uh, which uh, of these two uh, has, has a new dwarf galaxy in it. But if I show you the density of faint stars in each of these images, as determined by a computer program, then uh, it becomes very obvious that there's a substantial clustering of faint stars right at the center of this image on the right, uh, and nothing comparable 
in the one on the left. So this process gives us a way to detect dwarf galaxies that are too faint to see by eye and potentially enables us to discover many more galaxies than, uh, had, than it had been possible to identify previously. So over the last 15 years, um, we, we started off with our 11 uh, dwarf galaxies, known as in, of 2004. We've now found 46 new dwarf galaxies uh, since 2005. So this is a, a pretty, pretty amazing change. We've multiplied the number of satellites of our Milky Way by more than a factor of five in just, uh, just over 15 years. Um, and uh, uh, studying these new 46 dwarf galaxies has uh, kept me quite busy uh, for, for most of that time. But uh, if you remember, our theory predicts that there could be as many as a thousand dwarf galaxies. And we're, so we're still drastically short of that uh, prediction. And so that leads us to wonder whether it's possible that there could be even fainter dwarf galaxies that are, still remain invisible in the current digital sky surveys. So the way that we're going to answer that question is with a new telescope. Uh, it's currently under construction in Chile known as the Vera Rubin Observatory. Uh, this is scheduled to start operations in 2023-24. Uh, and so there are uh, a couple of really unique things about the Rubin Observatory. So this is a large telescope, an eight meter telescope. Uh, so more than three times the size of the, the 100 inch here. Um, and the Rubin Observatory is going to have the largest camera of any telescope that's ever been built. So you're probably familiar with uh, digital cameras that may have 10 megapixels, 20 megapixels, something like that. The camera for the Rubin Observatory has 3,200 megapixels. So here's, here's an image of one of the uh, uh, optical components of the camera up here with a couple of technicians for scale. So this camera is so large that it's going to al allow the Rubin Observatory to image the sky incredibly quickly. So it will take Rubin just about three nights to cover the entire sky uh, and compare that to the decades that it took the Palomar, Palomar Sky Survey using the telescopes down the road uh, to equivalently map the whole sky. So you might wonder what's the Rubin Observatory going to do once it's mapped the whole sky in three days? We're presumably not building the whole telescope just for those, those three days of data. Uh, so it's actually, it's going to keep uh, repeatedly scanning the sky uh, every few days for a total of 10 years. And so that's going to produce a couple of, uh, of really unprecedented data products. So first you'll, you'll be able to make a movie at any location in the sky where you can watch the brightness of stars change. You can watch stars move very slowly, of course. Uh, uh, I discover asteroids moving through the solar system. Uh, and so you'll be able to have these, these movies with hundreds of frames anywhere in the sky that you're interested in. Now, the other thing you can do if you have hundreds of images of the same part of the sky is you can combine them all into a single, much more sensitive image. So the, uh, that, and so if you do that with the Rubin, uh, Rubin Observatory images, that will make basically the most sensitive image of the sky that is possible to get from a ground-based telescope. You can do better from space, of course, uh, but this will be kind of the, the ultimate sky survey. Uh, and it will be sensitive to stars um, tens of times fainter than even our, our current generation of digital sky surveys are. And so that's exactly what you would want if you uh, were interested in trying to find out whether there are even fainter dwarf galaxies than we've spotted so far. So then the next question is, uh, all right, so the Rubin Observatory is, is almost certain to find faint groups of stars that may or may not be dwarf galaxies. Now, how can we be sure which ones are actually dwarfs so that we can count up the dwarfs and see if, if they agree with our theoretical prediction. Well, uh, back in the days when we were studying dwarf galaxies that looked like this from the Palomar Sky Survey, uh, it didn't really take a whole lot of thought to tell if something was a dwarf galaxy. You could grab any old astronomer off the street and ask them, is this a dwarf galaxy? And, and they would tell you yes. 
Now that we're uh, studying dwarf galaxies that look like this, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a trickier problem. So, uh, to see what we need to do, let's go back to our original definition of a galaxy. So a group of stars and gas held together by gravity. Um, over the last decade or so, it's been clear that we actually uh, need to add a new criterion to this definition. So in addition to the stars and gas, a galaxy needs to contain dark matter. So essentially every galaxy that we have studied in the universe uh, contains significant amounts of dark matter. And in contrast, all of the uh, groups of stars that we know of that aren't galaxies, star clusters for example, uh, uh, appear to contain no dark matter. So it's really the presence of dark matter that distinguishes galaxies from other kinds of stellar systems. So how are we going to be able to determine if uh, some faint group of stars found by the Rubin Observatory has some dark matter in it? Well, we need to measure how fast those stars are moving. Because if, a, uh, if we're looking at a dwarf galaxy, the dwarf galaxy has lots of dark matter in it, that dark matter creates a strong gravitational field, which pulls on the stars, makes them move more rapidly. So this is uh, just the same as, you know, if, if an astronaut goes up to the moon and tries jumping on the moon, the moon takes a long time to pull them back down because the moon is not very massive. It doesn't have a very strong gravitational field. On the other hand, if it were possible to land an astronaut on Jupiter, obviously we can't do that since Jupiter doesn't have anything to land on, but uh, just play along for a minute. And, uh, and you tried to jump on the surface of Jupiter, Jupiter will pull, will pull you back down very quickly because it, it's uh, it's much stronger gravitational field. And so uh, it's, it's uh, analogous how the dark matter in, in a galaxy pulls on the stars that are orbiting around it. Now, the problem is that uh, these stars, as I've been uh, telling you, are very faint. And so the only way of measuring how fast they're moving is going to be to use our largest telescopes. So today that would be the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, the Magellan telescopes in Chile. Uh, but in fact, for the, uh, the candidate dwarf galaxies discovered by Rubin, we're probably going to need even larger telescopes than we currently have, such as the giant Magellan telescope currently under construction, the 30 meter telescope, uh, and, and other facilities that are currently in the planning stages. So here's an example of what we might see when we're looking at the stars in, uh, in an object discovered by the Rubin Observatory. So uh, first, let's take the example where we're looking at a star cluster rather than a dwarf galaxy. In this case, there's no dark matter, so the only gravity of this cluster is provided by the stars themselves. Uh, they don't weigh very much, so the stars are not moving around very very fast. They're only going about half a kilometer per second, just 1,100 1, miles an hour, so they're barely moving at all. <laughs> On the other hand, when we're looking at a dwarf galaxy, then there's a lot more dark matter pulling on the stars, making them move more quickly, and the typical velocities that they're moving with are about five kilometers per second, or 11,000 miles per hour. So by measuring the velocities of stars in all of the candidate dwarf galaxies, that uh, the Rubin Observatory discovers. Uh, we hope to be able to identify a, uh, an even larger population of dwarfs and see if uh, all the hundreds or, or uh, perhaps a thousand dwarf galaxies that are predicted are really out there. But there's also a possibility that even after we've gone to all this work, building new telescopes, measuring the velocities of various faint stars, we'll find that in fact the total number of dwarfs is not that much larger than what we know about today. And so that brings up a potential nightmare scenario for astronomers. What if most of these uh, dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around our Milky Way never formed any stars at all? What if they're just naked clumps of dark matter uh, uh, sailing through space, with giving off no light? Uh, if, if that's the case, how is it going to be possible for us to test our theoretical prediction that there should be uh, large numbers of those objects out there? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, particle physicists have recently come up with a possible solution to this problem. 
So you probably know that if you take matter and antimatter and put them together, then they annihilate each other and produce a burst of radiation in the form of gamma rays. Gamma rays are just photons uh, with, with very high energies. So they're like x-rays, but even more energetic with uh, thousands or millions of times the energy of an x-ray. So if this proton and this antiproton collide, then uh, they disappear and you're left with two gamma rays. So it turns out that we think that dark matter may be able to do the same thing. And you don't even need to invent anti-dark matter in order to accomplish that because the, the particle physicists tell us that dark matter particles and dark matter antiparticles are actually the same thing. So all that needs to happen is that any two dark matter particles bump into each other and boom, you get some gamma rays. And the great thing about gamma rays, as opposed to dark matter particles, is that we actually know how to detect them. So in fact, we have gamma ray telescopes right now. Uh, so NASA launched in 2008 the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, the most sensitive gamma ray telescope ever built. There are also uh, different kinds of gamma ray telescopes that are located on the ground. And these telescopes are potentially sensitive enough to detect gamma rays coming from the annihilation of dark matter particles. So this is a map of the sky as seen in gamma rays by the Fermi telescope. You can see this uh, bright band across the center uh, of, the uh, of the map. This is uh, emission from very hot gas in our Milky Way. So the Milky Way glows in gamma rays just as it does at every other wavelength. And then most of the, the bright spots that you see above and below the Milky Way are uh, distant galaxies. In fact, the, the uh, gamma rays come from the giant black holes at the centers of those galaxies. Now, what's been particularly exciting over the last decade is that uh, an excess of gamma rays has appeared from the center of our Milky Way compared to the amount of gamma rays that were expected to produce there. And this excess has approximately the shape and the, en the energy spectrum that you would uh, expect if it were coming from dark matter particles annihilating with each other. So that's, that's very tantalizing. The problem is that the center of our galaxy is an incredibly complicated place. Essentially, everything that can be going on astrophysically that produces gamma rays is definitely happening at the galactic center. So for example, there uh, are lots of supernova explosions near the center of our galaxy. And supernova explosions produce lots of gamma rays. Those supernova explosions leave behind neutron stars and small black holes. Neutron stars and small black holes produce lots of gamma rays. Uh, you've also probably heard that there is a supermassive black hole, four, times, uh, four million times the mass of the sun, at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, Andrea Ghez, a professor at UCLA, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics last year for, uh, for the discovery of that black hole. Uh, and supermassive black holes, like small black holes, supernova explosions, and so on, produce lots of gamma rays. So if our predictions for how many gamma rays should be coming from the supermassive black hole and the supernova explosions and the other black holes are even a little bit wrong, then that could easily account for the appearance of this excess. And so it's very difficult to convince yourself uh, or to convince other astronomers and physicists that uh, this excess of gamma rays from the galactic center must be from dark matter as opposed to all the other astrophysical processes that uh, we uh, know are going on there. And so that's where the dwarf galaxies come in. Because of the places to look for this, these gamma rays from annihilating dark matter particles are the places where there's a lot of dark matter that are relatively close to us. And so the, the closest and densest uh, locations other than the center of our galaxy are the, the dwarf galaxies orbiting uh, our, our galaxy. And the nice thing about dwarf galaxies is that to a gamma ray astronomer, they're the most boring places in the universe. There's absolutely nothing going on in a dwarf galaxy that should be making any gamma rays at all, except perhaps for these dark matter particles colliding with each other and annihilating. So if you see any gamma ray signal at all from a dwarf galaxy, you can be pretty confident that uh, it must be coming from dark matter. So the Fermi telescope and, and some of the other gamma ray telescopes are collecting uh, more and more data on the, the satellites of the Milky Way in gamma rays, searching for this signal. 
they're almost at the, the sensitivity that you would need in order to see uh, the signal if, uh, if what we, the gamma rays seen from the galactic center actually are indeed from dark matter. And so over the next few years, we're hopeful that we'll, we will be able to conclusively test uh, the origin of this excess of gamma rays at the galactic center and perhaps confirm uh, the existence of dark matter and that there's actually a way of seeing it. And then finally, if we can detect some gamma rays coming from dwarf galaxies, then we could go out and look at the rest of the sky where we haven't spotted any dwarf galaxies and see if there are any similar gamma ray sources. And those could be uh, these dark galaxies, just clumps of, of dark matter with no stars in them. Uh, and so this is, is perhaps uh, the only way that we might be able to detect such objects if they exist. Uh, and so again, in, in the coming years, uh, you should keep an eye out for, uh, for news stories about gamma rays coming from, uh, from dark galaxies and dwarf galaxies in uh, the vicinity of our Milky Way. And we hope that, that that will enable us to test our theoretical predictions about dark matter. All right, so that's what I wanted to tell you about this evening. Uh, let me just quickly recap uh, a few of the things that, that I hope maybe you'll take away from this presentation. So we talked about what galaxies are made of, how they consist of uh, stars and gas and dust, but that just makes up a minor uh, fraction of the mass of a galaxy uh, with, uh, with uh, the dominant portion consisting of dark matter. So you can think of a galaxy as something like a little, little ball of stars surrounded by a much larger cloud of dark matter. We uh, can detect the presence of dark matter, even though we can't see it, based on how its gravity pulls the stars and the gas uh, in galaxies. Uh, it causes it, uh, we can measure the speeds of, of the rotation of spiral galaxies. We can measure the velocities of stars orbiting around dwarf galaxies to determine that they must contain this dark matter. And we've developed a pretty good theory of dark matter over the last several decades that works uh, remarkably well, except when we look carefully at dwarf galaxies, in which case we find these uh, little issues like there's supposed to be 10 or 100 times more dwarf galaxies than we've actually been able to find. But we've been making uh, very rapid progress on discovering new dwarf galaxies. We expect that that will continue for the next decade with the Rubin Observatory. Uh, and so we're, uh, we're hopeful that that in, in that kind of time span, we'll be able to finally have a complete census of all of the dwarf galaxies in our local universe. We'll be able to count them, compare them to our theoretical predictions, um, and, uh, and see if, uh, if the cold dark matter theory is correct. <clears throat> then the new dwarf galaxies that are discovered, we'll be able to observe them with, uh, we'll detect them with the Rubin Observatory, observe them with future telescopes like the Giant Magellan Telescope and with the Gamma Ray Observatories to, uh, to see if, if they are giving off this characteristic glow in gamma rays. Um, and that will ultimately give us definitive tests of whether we have successfully managed to understand dark matter despite not being able to see it, or if perhaps dark matter will turn out to be even stranger than we've yet imagined. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.